I hope that you sense the love that abounds among all of us as I do. And isn't it wonderful the tie that binds our hearts together in Christian love? The like precious faith that we share makes this lectureship worthwhile. But then in addition to that are the wonderful lessons that we've been privileged to hear throughout this week. In spite of the snow and the ice, we've still had a great lectureship. Our numbers have been way down, uh, but still uh, we've had a lot of faithful ones to come, and, and those that have been able to come have been greatly benefited. Tony Cloud, we hate to see you and your wife go back home. We love you so much, but have a good flight when you do go. And, Tell that pilot to drive carefully <laughs> over all those big old snow-capped mountains and everything. Uh, Brother Joe Chase uh, is, is a lovable person and a very capable person in so many ways. I feel like I've had a small influence on Joe's life. Uh, I was in a meeting down in Longview, Texas a number of years ago, and Joe was already preaching. In fact, he started preaching at age 16, but I talked to him about uh, furthering his education and all, and so he came to the Brown Trail School of Preaching and, and has been preaching ever since. Uh, he also has a bachelor's degree, a BA degree, from the Bear Valley Institute of the Bible in addition uh, to his training here at Brown Trail. He is the author of two books on music because, you see, he excels... Uh, as a song leader, he sings in a quartet, and uh, he's just uh, uh, so good in that area, but more especially in the preaching of the gospel. That's his first love. And one of his uh, main thrusts in preaching the gospel is he loves the work of our Lord in the island of Jamaica. And uh, we were down there once uh, while he was there, but he's gone nearly every year. How, how many years have you been down? 14? 14 years he's gone to the island of Jamaica. And he knows those people down there real well. And uh, uh, he's just done a marvelous work. I think Joe would be the first one to admit that his wife is smarter than he is. Now, you know, that's, that's tough for a guy to say that. My wife is smarter. But she is a genius when it comes to uh, the field of mathematics. And she's working on her doctorate degree in a very specialized field of mathematics that only very, very few people in our whole United States uh, have pursued. Uh, and I, it's so far above my head that I can't even tell you what it is. But maybe Joe will see fit to do so. We're glad to have them back in the, in the Metroplex. He's working with the church over at Burleson and is so congenial and so willing to help us out in every way. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you Brother Joe Chase, who's going to speak on the subject, Christ the Foundation Stone, from Isaiah chapter 28. Joe, you have 38. My wife is so smart because she married me. <laughs> no, that doesn't, doesn't, she must have had a bad day. The field of study that Cheryl is doing has to do with a special line of probability called combinatorics. And uh, it involves imaginary numbers. She came home one day talking about imaginary numbers. And I said, uh, Cheryl, if, if I'm correct, limited education that I have, isn't there an infinite number of numbers? Yes. Well, why did we have to invent some imaginary ones? She said, you just cannot understand. So, <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> and that's going to be okay. I've spent the last two days at a conference of Christian educators. Men and women who are shaping much of the curriculum that is used in the brotherhood. Brethren, it's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to go back to the pure, simple truth of Scripture. It's time for us to raise up young men and young women to know the truth 
to buy the truth and sell it not, no matter what somebody offers you to write a better book or a better way of doing something, if it's not the old-fashioned New Testament gospel, it's not worth 15 cents. Young men who are in preacher training school, I want to talk to you, especially this morning, about the wonderful foundation of Jesus Christ. If you would, hopefully this will work. Let me turn this on and it may work. In Isaiah chapter 22, verses 14 through 16, we primarily want to focus in on this part of the passage. Therefore, saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Some of the most expensive tools that a carpenter uses, that a builder uses, are those tools that measure the foundation, those things that make sure that things are plumb, that things are square, that things are exactly level. Those are some of the most expensive tools, and it even involves some mathematics. We all remember A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's the, uh, somebody's theory. Starts with a P. But anyway, we know that those tools are expensive. Why? Because if the foundation is off, everything else is going to be off. And if the foundation is off and you start building the house, it's hard to fix it later on. So start at a solid bedrock foundation. And brethren, we should know that that foundation is Jesus Christ. We need to understand that. Maxie said that I like to sing, and I really love to sing, but all singers know that you have to have a key tone, which is do of any scale. It's where you can go home and rest, and all the other degrees make sense, all the other notes make sense, only when you establish where home base is. Without it, you cannot have the sweet harmony of music. We need to have the foundation. So the simply profound idea before us this morning is that without Jesus, nothing is going to be correct. Nothing works out right if the foundation is wrong. Let's talk about God's foundation. First of all, God laid this this foundation in chapter 28, verse 16. Man did not set it. If God put it there, we need to leave it there. Leave the landmarks alone. Make sure that when we preach, that we preach as the oracles of God. God said it there, and Jesus Christ is the foundation truth of everything that we preach. Everything that this book holds for us is based upon, guess what? Jesus Christ. From Genesis through Revelation, it is His story. Brethren, if you will preach only out of this book, you will be a successful gospel preacher, whether Old Testament or New Testament. Scripture forbids that we change what God has set as the chief cornerstone. We can't monkey around with it. It must be what God says. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, the Scripture says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ. Let's never forget that. That if it pleased God to make Jesus the foundation, then I ought to be happy with Jesus as the foundation. We should make sure that Jesus is the focus of everything in our life. One of my first teachers in singing school was a man by the name of Holland Boring. And Brother Boring made a statement one time that when I was young, I didn't understand it, but as I grow older, I seem to catch on to it. He said, you shouldn't have a conversation that is not pre-planned. Well, how does that happen? You should be so infused with the love of Jesus Christ and the word of Jesus Christ, and he he should have uh, anchored your soul so strongly that you will not go out 
side of what Jesus would want you to say. Is that true or not true? Amen. Every conversation ought to be as if it were Jesus speaking. We ought to model before all men Jesus in our lives. Then we will win the world for Jesus Christ. The New Testament validates this principle that Jesus Christ is the center, the focus, the foundation of all things. Remember in the transfiguration? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Peter telling us, reminding us that where would we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. The Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 1 and beginning in verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet hath in these last days spoken unto us, how? By his son. Who's your son? Jesus Christ. And notice what he says, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made all of the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God recognizes Jesus as the foundation, as the cornerstone of everything that he would accomplish in this world. Everything that he wants man to know focuses around Jesus Christ, and we must remember that. Jesus himself testified concerning the fact that he is the chief corner in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. All authority has been given unto me. You don't go anywhere else. Joseph Smith, too bad. Jesus Christ is the corner. I don't go to Joseph Smith to find out what I need to do in order to go to heaven. I don't go to Mary Baker Eddy. I don't go to Joel Osteen. I don't go to my preacher. I go to God's book and I go and find out what it is that Jesus said. Luke testified in this way in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Neither is there foundation or salvation in any other, for there is None other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Oh, if we miss preaching Jesus, if we miss learning about Jesus, our lives are never going to be successful. They will be broken. Paul testifies over and over and over again when he tells us in Colossians that Jesus Christ is preeminent. He is above all things, and it's even by the word of His power that all things hold together. And when Jesus says it's finished, it is finished. Let us not forget that. I love what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I like that. Jesus fills all in all. He is the supreme. He is the highest. But he is the foundation. And we cannot forget that. Building on the wrong foundation makes us failures at all God intends for man to accomplish in his days on this earth. When you miss Jesus, you miss it all. Notice in Philippians chapter 2, we learn that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess what? Jesus is Lord. I hope we never lose sight of that. Colossians chapter 2. We are to be rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. What faith? The faith of Jesus Christ. Let's never depart from that. When people come in and tell you that, hey, we've got a better gospel, you better say, get behind me, Satan. We don't need another gospel. God determined that Christ would be the foundation of our lives, both in Matthew 17 at the Transfiguration, John chapter 12. But what does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus is 
the focus, is the foundation, is the bedrock on which to build our lives. What does that mean to me? It means that without a sure foundation, your house will fall. Have any of you been to New Orleans and seen the devastation that can happen to a house when hard times hit? It'll slide right off of the foundation. I grew up south of here in the black gumbo mud. We lived in an old frame house that was built on pier and beams. And every summer, part of our job every summer was to go under the house, jack it up, and reset it on the pillars. Every year we did that. Why? Because the old black gumbo mud would walk around on you. When it would rain and things would move, then it would dry out. And you've seen some of those cracks that if you were a small duck, you would just be lost to society. I don't know what ducks have to do with society, but they don't want to walk around where there's big cracks. Well, without Christ, just as a, a house will fail and fall, lives fail and fall. Houses and lives that are built upon something other than Jesus bring nothing but abuse and sorrow and shame and hurt. Sometimes even to those who are innocent. Isn't it a tragedy when we start listening to those men in black robes tell us that it's okay to kill babies? Well, they bound to know because they're wearing a big black robe. They left out God's foundation when they made that decision. They forgot to go back and say, what does the Creator think about this? And we have been educated beyond our intelligence when we leave out the foundational truth that God says, do no murder. God gave us life, and He's the only one that shall take life. What does it mean to us? We need to be wise builders. I love the wise man built his house upon the rock. Jesus has just given us the most beautiful illustration of what it means to be God's person in that beautiful Sermon on the Mount. And he says, you know, those of you who hear me and do what I say, you have built a strong foundation and when the things happen in life, you're going to be all right. Don't be a hearer only, but do the things that you hear. James chapter 1 and verse 25. But who looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein. You know, anytime we see a TH in the King James Version, that's present active indicative, meaning continual action present right now just like it's happening and if you are right now doing what God wants you to do looking into the perfect perfect law of liberty and patterning your life after that don't forget and you do that what does James say you will be blessed you will be blessed that's a wise builder the live that is lived in Christ will withstand the storms and trials that is going to beset every one of us. Have you had trouble in your life? Boy, I have. Brother, when you were talking about getting fired for preaching the truth, I know what that means. You don't know how hard it is to sit in an elders meeting and see men that you have entrusted your soul to tell you don't preach on that because it'll cut our contribution. And then when you say, I cannot help but preach that which was delivered to us through the Scripture, and they say, well, you need to find another place to do it. That breaks your heart. And How do you get over that? You remember that God said, I'll take care of you. Why would you fear anything that man's going to do? Haven't I been giving you your paycheck all along? It's not these men. You're not an elder's preacher. You're God's preacher. And I'll take care of you. And I have yet. I've been fired more than one time in my brief career. And I have yet 
to miss a meal. See? Doing fine. In fact, God might be thinking, maybe you need to live off the fat of the land for a while. It's going to be okay. But you will withstand the trials of life that befall us. Foolish builders, they don't care. They don't listen to what God says. And they just do whatever they want to do. However, in this story, some people did hear. They even built a house. They were busy. But they built it on the wrong foundation. And therefore, their lives were ruined. And you know, it's a continual catastrophe if it's left that way until judgment. Every one of us have to choose. You and I have to make a decision every day. Have you found that you can't make the decision to be good one time six years ago and be good for the rest of your life? I find it a struggle sometimes, especially driving up here on the ice where there's people out there, well, bless their hearts, they just don't know how they're supposed to be driving. It's hard to be good sometimes. So you have to consciously make the decision, God bless them, <laughs> instead of what I wanted to say. I have to make the decision, am I going to take Christ as my cornerstone, as the bedrock of my life, or am I going to choose the shifting sands of the world, which sometimes are much more glamorous and glitzy and beautiful and, and wonderful out there for a time, until you wake up in the morning and God says, uh, you have to give an account for what you did. You have to make a choice every day. Heaven or hell? I have to make a choice. Will I hear well done or depart? Notice Psalm 127, the first part of that says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. How foolish to have the pattern and not use it. To have the blueprint of absolute success, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And maybe we should turn that around. We're not just living in eternity. We're living right now, and this is the best life that you can live. You can't find more blessings than the Christian's life. But everyone has to choose. Foolish people, they neglect the foundation of Jesus Christ. And therefore, they bring horrible consequences upon themselves and upon those round about them. Remember the judgment scene? That's a horrible description in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. When Christ and his, with his mighty angels re being revealed from heaven in flaming fire taking vengeance upon those that obey not the gospel and who do not God. And they will be punished, how long? With everlasting destruction. That term, ionios, the same word that describes eternal destruction describes the eternal God. And as long as there is a God, there is punishment for those who fail to meet his standard. So we have to really think about how am I going to live my life? A wise person is going to seek God's counsel for everything that he does in his life. Now if I tell you that, that my life centers around Jesus Christ and everything that Jesus wants me to do in my life, and by the way, here's my business card and it's for some pornographic website, are you going to believe that I'm living for Jesus? Of course not. So I have to realize that I will seek the Lord even about what job I take, what woman I marry, what package I buy on television. You know, this may be why I got fired, I don't know. <laughs> Sometime, one time I went to a, a, do a gospel meeting and I told the brethren, the elders have done some research at the local uh, movie rental place. And they've looked at the movies that you guys have been renting. And if 
If you need to come forward for that, please do. Whew! <laughs> People were like, oh, can they really do that? Well, you know what? If you're afraid what somebody might find out, you better not be doing it right now. You better ask God, is this the television show you want me to watch? Amen. Is this the website that I ought to be going to? No, it's not. Then don't do it. The only thing separating the wise man and the foolish man is the foundation of Jesus Christ. They both built a house. The wise man chose to build it on Jesus and not the shifting sands of the earth. Why should I choose Christ? Well, number one, trials are going to come. Your life is going to have trials. Abraham had trials. God tested him. Job had trials. You want to see a verse that scares me? 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. All that will live godly in Christ, perhaps might, maybe, suffer persecution? No. Shall suffer persecution. There's your promise. Bob Tilton has lied to us all. Even when you're doing good, bad stuff will happen. And if you don't have your life based upon Jesus Christ, when those hard times come, you will go down like a rock. James teaches us that only those who have endured the temptation and come out on the other side shall have the crown of life. It is Christ, the solid rock, that gives us the strength to endure all of life's hardships. I hope we remember that. Notice in Psalm 16, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Why? Why would you move when he's taking care of you? He is my rock, my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Psalm 62, verse 6. How sweet it is to know that the one that fights hardest for us is the one that made us and gives us the ability to overcome. And he knows when you're hurting. He knows when you're struggling. And he will pull you through. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Another reason we should choose Christ is that there's only one opportunity for building. There's not going to be a second chance. If we miss this chance, if we miss this opportunity that God gives us, there's not another one coming. And we cannot recover. No second chances. However, if a man builds his life on Christ, the foundation will come through those trials and be better suited for heaven. Wasn't it Brother Warren that used to say that this world is a veil for soul making. This is the opportunity to get ready for heaven. Let's get ready. Now here comes the hard part because I'm preaching to the choir. You guys know that we can only preach the truth. We must preach it in love, but we must preach the truth. Sadly, that's not happening in all of the pulpits of the brotherhood. I was speaking to a man who runs one of the biggest publishing houses in, I guess you would call it the Brotherhood. And he's told me that we have enough preachers. We just don't have enough preachers that are telling the truth. I said, amen, brother. We can't preach anything except what Jesus gave us to preach. Maybe it's that some preachers aren't spending enough time in their Bibles to know the truth. Maybe they have quit studying. Maybe it's too much of a challenge for them. Look, if you don't have time to study God's Word, get out of the preaching business. Do yourself a favor because the judgment that comes upon you is going to be a lot more severe leading people down the wrong way than if you just stop right now and, and don't do any more damage. Get ready to spend your life with your nose in the book, reading and studying. 
Shame on you if you're depending upon last year's sermon at this time and maybe just preaching it backwards. you got to restudy and redo and make them live. Preach the word. But maybe it's more sinister than that. Have you thought about this? That maybe the devil has a hold on some of these preachers and is using them as instruments to destroy what God has set up or try to destroy because he can never win. No matter how many preachers the devil gets on his side, the church will still be here and the church will still succeed and we will still have the truth. But we need more preachers preaching the truth. Christ's teaching is the ultimate in preaching material. You will never run out of sermons. Maxie, you've been preaching over 52 years. We love you, Maxie. And I hope that God gives you 52 more wonderful years. I don't know about Fran. She may not want that many. But uh, she has to live with you every day. Have you ever run out of a sermon? Why? Because he preaches the Bible. He already has a sermon book. That's what sets him apart from a lot of other preachers in the brotherhood. And young preacher students... Be that way. Be an expository preacher. Expose what God has given us. The Bible alone, the foundation of Jesus Christ and his message alone is the power to save. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. It is the power alone to set us free. John 8 and verse 32. It is his power alone to make us clean. John 15 verse 3. To make us complete. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 17. The Bible is all we need. And that's what we need to be preaching. Preaching Christ is the whole purpose of preaching. Our Savior was clear when he said to men that they would be judged by the very words that he spoke. uh, John chapter 12 and verse 48. So why would you preach anything else? That's what people need to hear. Without the foundation of Jesus Christ in every sermon, preaching just becomes a hollow, lifeless, pointless process that does no one any good at all. You don't even feel so good when you leave church not having been filled from a preacher who has spent his week filling his heart and his mind and his spirit with the word of God. Preachers are to build upon the already solid foundation which is Jesus Christ by preaching the whole counsel of God. Acts 20 and verse 27. The gospel alone is God's power to save and if you monkey with it, it loses the power to save. Why? Because it ceases to be the word of God and it becomes your words and your words are like my words. They're not worth a whole lot. Just ask my wife. Galatians 1, 6 through 9 terrifies me for a lot of preachers who have perverted the truth. The perverted gospel has never helped anyone go to heaven. One of the saddest stories in Scripture is in 1 Kings chapter 13 about a man who believed a lie. Did it make any difference to him what he believed, what he listened to? He's still dead. Brethren, listeners have as much responsibility in the preaching process as the preacher. Amen? Is it not the hearer's responsibility to take heed how they hear, what they hear, and make sure that you are preaching the truth? And you better hug the neck of the little old lady that comes up to you and corrects you on what you have preached if it's not the truth. Don't get mad at anybody who's trying to help you. Because there will be times, I I know, we hate to think that we could ever make a mistake, but sometimes we misspeak. And there have been times when we have tried to say something and it didn't come out at all like we were thinking we were saying. And if somebody catches that, you hug their necks and say, thank you for loving me enough to fix that problem. That's what we need. And that's what we should be doing. We've got to hurry along here because Maxie set this clock 15 minutes ahead of what it was. 
<laughs> no, he didn't. I'm just teasing. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, not if, not if the lackluster, perverted gospel be, left, be lifted up, but if he is lifted up. The only way we can lift up Christ is how? To preach Christ and him crucified. That's what we need. We should be like Paul saying that I've spent my whole time while I've been amongst you preaching the whole counsel of God. I didn't hold anything back because I knew it wouldn't be prudent for you and it wouldn't be profitable for me. So I told you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And sometimes it broke my heart to say it. Sometimes it, it kept me awake for two or three days knowing that I was going to have to deal with this problem. But I said it anyway. Oh, but yes, we need to preach it with love and with tenderness, considering others lest we also be in the same condition they are in some other time. Let's preach Christ in the way that Christ preached it himself. Only to, uh, until a person listens, not much preaching, preaching gets done. Great care must be given not only to what we hear, but how we hear. Careful listeners and what we do with it. Remember the Bereans? Acts 17. Young Timothy was told, you know, you learn salvation. By what? This holy scriptures. Those are the things you heard. Those are the things you were taught. Go back to those. Remember those and keep those. Judgment Day is going to be a tragic day and a triumphant day. It is going to be the most glorious day for those that have chosen the right foundation. My Granny Chase didn't obey the gospel until she was in her 80s. She had been searching for many, many years and had heard many false teachers uh, in the denominations tell her a whole lot of different things. And she finally, the thing that got her was the Bible teaching on the Lord's Supper. She could not understand why it was in many of the denominations that they partake of the Lord's Supper only once a quarter or maybe even once or twice a year. And she said, I don't see that the Bible teaches that. It says that they gather together upon the first day. And I asked Granny, how do you know it was every first day? She said, well, it says the first day of the week, and every week has a first day. She came up with that on her own. There wasn't some preacher that told her that. She found that on her own, in her own Bible. And she began to question other things about the denominations, and she finally came to the truth. Well, Granny spent the last few years of her life in a nursing home in Hillsboro, Texas. And Granny was a big gal. It runs in our family. I'm not a big gal, but I'm a big guy. <laughs> um, and Granny had diabetes and had all of the troubles that accompany diabetes. She was losing her eyesight. She had necrotic toes. And if you don't know what those are, that means your toes are falling off because blood can't get to them. She was in pain a lot of the times. And when you would go visit Granny, most of the time she would be in her wheelchair laying in her bed praying. And out of respect for the fact that she was praying, even though a lot of times they were really long prayers, and I was just a kid, and I thought, come on, Granny, you've got to run out of something. But she would always end her prayers this way. Lord Jesus, come again quickly, real soon scare me to death, Maxie. But she was ready. She had prepared her life. She had obeyed the truth. She had studied it and she had lived it. And as a result, she was so longing for the day of judgment. When my step-grandfather died, he was a Bitter, bitter, bitter man. And I was standing at his bedside as he breathed his last 
cursing God. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you've been a good boy your whole life. I am scared to death to die. But I'm not going to change at this point. What a difference between Granny Chase and that man. What's judgment going to be for you? Will you be able to say to Jesus, I preached the truth, the whole truth. I built my life on the foundational principles of Jesus Christ, and I shared that with others. And I did the best I can. Or will you face judgment saying, I just did whatever I wanted to? I hope we choose the first, the greater part. God bless you for listening, and let's pray that God give us a safe journey when we leave today. By the way, thank you for asking me to be here. Uh, Maxie scheduled this ice storm because he wasn't sure what I was going to preach, and he didn't want a big crowd here <laughs> for it. I don't.